Welcome to Educate for Life Radio. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. My website's educateforlife.org, and I'm down here in Southern California uh, where we're uh, dealing with all the quarantine stuff that uh, you, you probably got a different version than we do. We're, we're pretty uh, locked down here in uh, Southern California, but I'm um, just praying that uh, God uh, opens up the doors for the schools and for people to learn and, and for uh, churches to be back in action. So um, I'm down here on, on K Praise, 12, 10 a.m., uh, down in Southern California, but we're also all over the web. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're everywhere. And uh, so if you're just joining us, we're glad to have you here. Uh, my guest this evening is Dr. Jay Weil. If you've been around the homeschool community, um, you have probably heard his name. He went to the University of Rochester in upstate New York to study chemistry and ended up getting a PhD in nuclear chemistry. So that's a pretty impressive there, pretty incredible. Uh, he's done research in that field for quite a while. He's worked for the Department of Energy doing research, as well as the National Science Foundation. He's published more than 30 articles in nationally recognized peer-reviewed journals and has more than 13 books to his credit, including a full curriculum. So if you're interested in checking out his curriculum, curriculum, bereanbuilders.com, um, a curriculum that's God-focused and biblically-focused and science-focused. So, uh, Dr. Wow, thanks for being here this evening. No, it's great to be here. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, um, I love this stuff, uh, you know, all the science stuff that we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, you're ex an expert in nuclear chemistry, and um, uh, it's really nice to be able to talk to somebody who knows their stuff when it comes to things like carbon dating, when it comes to stuff like uh, radioisotope dating and, and these sorts of things. My, uh, I'm an apologetics teacher. I teach 12th grade apologetics at a Christian high school here in Southern California. We're just getting into the whole science and creation evolution debate and these sorts of things. And probably one of the most common questions that comes up during our discussions with, with the, uh, the 12th graders, the seniors, uh, gets into the nitty gritty of, okay, what's going on with radioisotope dating, with carbon dating? And, and there's this big battle back and forth over uh, who's, who's got uh, the truth when it comes to how do we date the, the world? You know, how do we date the universe? How do we date rocks? And and why is there this ridiculous discrepancy between biblical time frames when we, we, we have creationists saying 6,000 years, and then we have billions of years, right? Um, we're talking, a lot of people believe the universe is somewhere around 15 billion, 16 billion years old, with a universe that's 28 billion uh, light years across. And so, uh, Dr. Weil, I'm excited to, to hear you actually worked in... Um, a radiocarbon lab, or you, you were at one of the most um, uh, popular labs in the country. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I got my PhD uh, at the University of Rochester Nuclear Structure Research Lab, uh, and the fellow who was in charge of, that, of the group, the research group that did uh, radiometric dating, Harry Gove, he was the one who really pioneered using a particle accelerator to do radiocarbon dating. Uh, because that makes it much more precise uh, and gets you to a much deeper time scale than what the old version was. Uh, so uh, he was pioneering. So the that group was considered one of the one of the top groups in the nation when it came to doing any kind of radioactive dating. They specialized in carbon dating, but they did all radioactive dating. Now I didn't work with that group, but I was at that lab. And of course we uh, have all these meetings and so forth. And whenever they're doing an experiment, you're down there watching them and seeing what they're doing, because that's just the way these collaborative things work. And so that's what, you know, before, when I, before I uh, started working at this lab, before I started getting my PhD at this lab, I was really happy with the idea that the earth was billions of years old. That didn't bother me at all. Uh, I was a Christian at that point, but that kind of uh, uh, time scale didn't bother me at all. Um, so I was really happy to, to believe that. But then when I actually started seeing how this radiometric dating was done, uh, I saw that, you know, the first thing I saw was, and it was really funny because the very, very first time I saw this, uh, I was uh, uh, working with one of the other grad students and he was just doing one of the, he was running one of the samples that they had been given to date. Uh, and he was showing, and, and there were all sorts of points on the graph as to, you know, what, uh, what the age was. And he then took his, his, what we called a cursor. It was actually a light pen back then. Uh, he took his light pen and he X'd out that mark and he X'd out that dot and he X'd out that dot. And I said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm throwing away those points because they don't make sense. And I said, <laughs> why don't they make sense? And, and he said, 
Well, because they indicate that it's too old for the rock it was found in. And so basically what they were doing was they were ignoring <laughs> the data points that disagreed with the general geological time frame uh, that, that they were given. So I can't remember exactly what, what one that sample was from, but let's just say it was from Cambrian rock. And, and you know, if the, if the, if the date said that it was only, only 10 million years old or more than 600 million years old, they just throw it out because they know Cambrian rock's not that young, not that old. And so basically they just throw away the data they don't like. And it happened a lot. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't want to say that, you know, they threw away 90, 90% 90 of the data or anything like that, but they were throwing away so much more data than I would ever do in my, <laughs> any of my research. That yeah. really sort of started me down the trail of learning how bad radioactive dating really is. Uh, and so in the end, uh, I've come to the conclusion over many years and looking at this from many different ways that we can believe carbon-14 dating to about 3,500 years uh, because we have a really solid calibration for carbon-14 dating. Now, the theoretical limit for carbon dating is 55,000 years, so it's never used for the billions of years stuff. That's So I've, that's other I've heard, things. so uh, Dr. Wall, I've heard that... Um, the the maximum limit for carbon dating is two hundred thousand years. No. Where where is that number coming from? I because I'm not sure because you know you can you can look at this in the uh, in the literature. I mean I think maybe theoretically you might be able to get down to that. What would that be? Would that be uh, uh, for, uh, forty half lives? No, that would be uh, four. Four yeah, it'd be forty half lives. I don't see how you can do that. Generally speaking, we say the limit for a radioactive pro uh, radioactive dating process is ten half lives. And the half-life of uh, carbon-14 is 57-something, 100 years. So that'd be about 57,000 years is the theoretical limit. The practical limit is usually lower than that because, generally speaking, there's enough contaminants in the system and everything that really you get very skeptical, uh, even if you believe this stuff, of anything that's, that's 45,000 years or more, and certainly 50,000. Usually, if you look in the scientific literature where they're actually doing radiocarbon dating, they typically would use, say, greater than 50,000 uh, if they felt like they couldn't use carbon-14 dating. So the practical limit really is 50,000, maybe 45,000 years. The theoretical limit's 57. I, I suppose there may be new techniques for how to even uh, make even measure smaller amounts of carbon-14, but it wouldn't matter because at that point, you're so much into the contamination range that there's just no practical use for it. Okay, so, so um, let's back up a little bit for, our, for the average layperson. Can you just give us a basic breakdown explanation of carbon-14 dating and the, the, the controversy between yeah. uh, the, the evolutionary community that's advocating and saying, we use this to achieve this goal versus what the criticism is from the, the creationist community uh, saying, no, sorry, that's not going to work. Yeah. Okay. So, and carbon 14 dating can, the, these kinds of uh, assumptions can kind of be extended to the others. All of them are a little different, but they all are all basically the follow the same. Yeah. yeah. So in, uh, in any radioactive dating method, you can measure how much of an isotope exists now, and you can measure how much of any other uh, relevant uh, 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 atoms are there. Uh, and you, but, but you have to assume how much was there originally. Yeah. Uh, and if you assume how much was there originally, you measure how much is there now. That difference is how much has decayed from how much is decayed. If you know how fast it decays, then you can determine uh, the, the time frame. That's the general radiometric dating idea for carbon 14 dating. It's well, as you're living, you're exchanging carbon with your environment. So any living organism continually replenishes the carbon-14 in its system. However, when it dies, that stops. So uh, we can assume while it's alive, it has this set amount of carbon-14 in it. When it dies, now that carbon-14 can't be replenished, so now it starts to decay. Uh, and so if we assume how much it was there when it, was, when, it, when it died, we measure how much is there now. We know that every 5,720 years or so, uh, uh, half of that carbon-14 goes away. We can figure out how old it is uh, from the difference in how much we assumed and how much we actually measure. Of course, the assumption uh, is the tricky part. Uh, in the end, we can measure how much carbon-14 is in the atmosphere now, and that's basically how much is in organisms and so forth. 
Um, and so we can maybe say that's always been the same, so we'll use that. Well, it turns out if you make that assumption, then we can measure things of known age and find out that's wrong. So what we can do is we can try and take things we know the age of that were once alive, measure the carbon-14 that's in them now, and say, okay, anything that would die the year this guy died would have this much carbon-14 in it. And so if I measure this much carbon-14, it's as old as that guy. Mm. And the great thing is tree rings do that. When a tree forms a new ring, the old ring dies. Uh, and so if I count back the rings on a tree and I count the ring 501, that ring died 500 years ago. Uh, so I can say, okay, let's measure how much carbon-14 is in that ring now. Right? And anything that's 500 years old ought to have that much carbon-14 in it. Uh, and that's the cow, that's the basically, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's basically the way we do it. Now, the problem is we run out of tree rings that we know the age of at about 3,500 years because the oldest tree with rings that we have is 4,700 years old or something like that. And we're not allowed to use that because that's a national treasure. Yeah, so Methuselah, basically, I think yeah, Methuselah. Methuselah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So basically, we have a calibration using tree rings from living trees back to about 3,500 years ago. After that, we have to start using calibrations that are a little less accurate. So we can use fossilized trees, and we try and line up the patterns of the tree rings in the fossilized tree to tree uh, patterns of tree rings in the living trees to extend the tree rings backwards. Um, and so that's fairly good, and that can go back to about 10,000 years, if you believe that kind of stuff. Uh, but once again, that's assuming matching these tree ring patterns is good, and we can show that that gets worse and worse the older the tree rings get. After that's over, they have to use corals and things like that. So every step in the calibration gets less and less accurate. So basically, carbon-14 dating is very accurate, I think, from zero to 3,500 years ago because we've got this excellent living tree ring, you know, not living tree ring, but tree rings from living trees calibration. Uh, and so for archaeology and so forth, it can be a really good tool. Um, once we pass 3,500 years, you can look at it as an estimate because we still have a kind of a calibration, but that calibration is not as accurate anymore, so it's more of an estimate. And you can see the farther back you go, the worse it becomes. Yeah. Yeah. And the easiest way to say that, uh, to show that is uh, uh, ask an evolutionist, how old is this dinosaur bone? Right? So if I got this dinosaur bone that's uh, from a uh, triceratops, it's those guys went extinct at 65 million years old, uh, 65 million years ago, according to these guys. So this bone ought to, uh, ought to not be carbon datable. It ought to have no carbon date, uh, carbon 14 in it because it's been, uh, been sitting around for 65 million, million years, which is a lot longer than the carbon 14 can survive. Yet every time creationists have dated dinosaur bones, they find carbon 14 in them. And the carbon 14 indicates they're somewhere between 22,000 and 44,000 years old. So now we absolutely know, even given the old earth assumptions, we know there's something wrong with carbon 14 dating. Yeah, because it dates these dinosaur fossils as too young. So have uh, you have you had yeah. a discussion with you know somebody who's you know uh, doing this sort of dating? I mean, there's yeah. still uh, you know carbon dating bones and all these sorts of things and everything. Uh, and and have you had this honest discussion with them? Where, uh, what is the response? Yeah. So uh, generally speaking, they want to say that these uh, the these uh, uh, dinosaur bones and so forth they have somehow gotten some carbon-14 in them by contamination processes. Uh, maybe in the process of unearthing the fossil, this carbon-14 got introduced. Maybe in the process of taking the sample, this carbon-14 got introduced. And so in the end, this is all contamination. My point to them always is, but wait a minute, you got to go through the same processes anytime you carbon date. So if this dinosaur bone dates at 32,000 years old, then in the end, any carbon date that's 32,000 years old, you got to be skeptical about. Yeah, because everything, it's got it's got the same suspect. processes. Yeah, it's, it goes exactly through the same processes, yeah. you know, and, and we you know, we know that if you just try and carbon date an empty sample uh, jar, it comes out with not carbon datable because there's no carbon 14 in it. So we know the actual accelerator process that's used doesn't introduce carbon 14. 
So in the end, it's something from the sample. And maybe maybe there is contamination. I don't know. But if it's true, it's, it calls into question any carbon date that's really as old or older than any of these dinosaur bones ended up being mm. made. Uh, but the, the problem is when you're, when you're working with people who have these set assumptions already, what they'll always say is, well, well we know this thing has got to be it's got to be on the order of 20 or 30,000 years old because it's found in tertiary rock, you know, it's, or quat, sorry, quaternary rock and quaternary rock is, is, you know, is very, very young. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so in the end they'll say, yeah, okay, we know the dinosaur bones are a billion millions of years old because they're in Cretaceous rock, you know? <laughs> and yeah. so and they so, think they're, they're justified just, in ignoring the carbon 14 dates from Cretaceous rock because they know it can't the question. be. They're just, they're begging the question and they're yeah. ultimately just, uh, following their their paradigm, their with which they which basically has no foundation. They're just trusting well, that the rock is that. You know, there's a theoretical foundation to all this. I mean, these scientists aren't idiots. Yeah. So you know, uh, there's a theoretical foundation. The the idea uh, sounds good. You know, assume amount, measure amount, difference tells you time. That sounds really good. So there is a foundation for it. But the problem is when you actually start comparing one data to uh, another piece of data, that's where you find lots of inconsistencies. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. this is true throughout radiometric dating, whether you're talking about carbon dating or something else. Uh, you know, so, you know, uh, uh, if I date some parts of the island of Hawaii, for example, they date to be about 500,000 or uh, uh, half a million years old. Uh, and that's where, that's what, that's what, uh, uh, evolutionists think the island of Hawaii, that's roughly the age the island of Hawaii is supposed to be. But you can find rocks on the island of Hawaii that are 32 million years old by the same dating processes. Well, mm -hmm. what the what evolutionists will say is, well, we know that's wrong because the island of Hawaii only formed half a million years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and so we know all these other dates have to be wrong. So basically, there this is this is uh, a situation that happens a lot in science. It's called confirmation bias. Yeah. There are certain ideas they have, and any time a piece of data confirms that idea, it's good. And any time a piece of data doesn't confirm this idea, there's something wrong with it, and we can throw it away, yeah. or we can ignore it, or we can study it more to find out what's wrong with it. And that's, you know, confirmation of bias appears everywhere in science. But for some reason, especially in evolutionary terms and age of the earth terms, it's almost like a religion. Yeah, crazy. Uh, for those of you just tuning in, my, my guest today is Dr. Jay Weil, and uh, he has a PhD in nuclear chemistry. And we're just talking about, um, you know, radioisotope dating, specifically carbon dating here. Um, you can check out his stuff at brianbuilders.com. And, um, you know, uh, Dr. Weil, w when um, this is such a huge issue as it pertains to, you know, some people, you know, talk about, you know, why, why discuss this? Why is this an issue that we even talk about? And when I'm talking to my students, I say, well, Listen, you know, the age of the earth, it's a significant issue because if the earth is as young as the Bible seems to indicate, it, it takes away uh, the argument for evolution to a large degree. Well, yeah. And so, you know, it, it doesn't affect whether we go to heaven or hell. Uh, you know, that's uh, our, our faith in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, it really does do a lot to either, uh, uh, you know, give credibility to evolution or take away credibility from evolution. Um, do you think that this is an issue as far as radioisotope dating is concerned and everything that that um, more and more the public needs to be aware of? Uh, is, are, are people becoming aware of this or is this an issue that uh, people are kind of like, you know what, not even worth discussing. Let's just push it to the side. I mean, scientists are smart guys. Are they are they looking at this and going, you know what, we've got to figure out a different way to date things? Well, every now and again, just like like a, uh, I can't remember exactly how many years ago, maybe two, maybe three years ago. Uh, there was a really good physicist who wrote a paper saying, you know, and we've never thought about this before, but every radiometric dating technique is going to be uh, affected by diffusion. Uh, and since each radioisotope has a different amount of mass, the diffusion for each radioisotope is different, and that's going to skew radioisotope dating. Uh, and he wrote this great paper. I blogged about it. And, you know, in his paper, he showed that, you know, this diffusion could make an error as high as 45 million years or 45 billion years old, you know, <laughs> which oh. is much higher than the age of the earth or anything. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's an extreme. But what he's saying is this could really be almost all of the date. <laughs> it's just this issue of diffusion. Uh, and, you know, he, he suggested a couple ways people might try and model uh, uh, their way out of this situation. 
And, and so I kind of thought this would at least get the scientific community a little interested, but I haven't really seen much about that since. So I don't think, I don't think a lot of people, you know, I think some people look at it and say, Hey, there's some problems here, but I don't think it ever catches on uh, yeah. as something that, uh, uh, that really needs to be looked at. And it's, it's been, a, it's really unfathomable to me. I say this a lot when I uh, speak in front of uh, churches and so forth, any, any organization, when I talk to people about this whole issue, biological evolution, age of the earth and everything, uh, they seem to think that this age of the earth is utterly settled. We've got a number. We know how old the earth is. Uh, but the fact is there are so many inconsistencies in all the different ways that we may measure the age of the earth. As a scientist, I say there is no way scientifically we know. Absolutely not. I am more likely as a scientist to believe in biological evolution from a single common ancestor all the way. I, that is more reasonable scientifically than a billions of year old. Earth. Oh, wow. And yet for some reason, everybody looks at billions of year old earth as settled. I just do not understand that because there is no way you can say that from a scientific point of view, just no possible way. So what are some of, in your mind, and, and when you're talking to people, what are some of the biggest discrepancies that make you go, no way, this, there's no way the earth is billions of years old because of this? Oh, okay. what, are, what are some of those? Yeah, so uh, uh, one of the most striking things uh, that, you know, and it's absolutely necessary for life is the earth's magnetic field. Uh, and, uh, we kind of understand where the Earth's magnetic field comes from. It comes from a currents of electricity running through the outer core of the Earth. Uh, how those currents got set up is a matter of debate, and evolutionists have one view, and creationists have another view, and so forth. Um, but uh, uh, in 1984, uh, a, a creation scientist, uh, Russell Humphreys, developed a theory for how planetary magnetic fields work and so forth. He applied it to all the planets that we, uh, whose magnetic fields we know, and, 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 and it, it, it worked. But that's not what a, 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 uh, determines a scientific theory. What determines a scientific theory is if it can make predictions about things that aren't known, and then you go out and measure sure. those things, and those predictions are confirmed. That's what makes, and that's really the judge of a scientific theory. It doesn't matter how much the scientific theory makes sense or anything like that, or how much it describes known data. It's how well it predicts unknown data. And then, you know, you test that. Well, you know, it, in his 1984 paper, he said, now we don't know the magnetic fields of Neptune and Uranus, but they'll eventually be measured. Here's what they should be. Well, they about six years later, they were measured and they were exactly what he suggested they should be. The old Earth uh, version of the model was a factor of 10,000 off, at least for Uranus. It oh, was wow. also wrong for Neptune, but not nearly as badly. Um, and since then, he's made other predictions like, uh, uh, for example, he said, look, we know Mars doesn't have a big planetary magnetic field. Now my theory explains why, but my theory also says it should have had one at one time. The older theory says it shouldn't have. Well, it turns out that after measuring a bunch of Martian meteorites, we now do think that uh, Mars had a planetary magnetic field. So once again, that's something he predicted before the data were known. And his most mm. striking prediction yet yeah, is that in 1975, he, uh, we measured the magnetic field of Mercury. Older theory said it sh Mercury shouldn't have a magnetic field, but a magnetometer is pretty cheap, so they put one on, on, on the robotic spacecraft. Turns out their older theory was wrong. Mercury does have a planetary magnetic field. Well, we went back there uh, in 2010 or something like that, um, and according to the younger theory, the magnetic shell field should have decreased a measurable amount. According to the older theory, it shouldn't have. Uh, over that time period. Well, when they got back and measured it, they found it decreased almost, almost precisely the amount that the young earth theory predicted. All right. Wow. So that's one thing I say, if the earth is billions of years old, one thing we absolutely don't understand at all is planetary magnetic field because all older theories of planetary magnetic fields are rotten. And the only good ones, a young earth theory. Um, and we could say that about other things uh, as well. You know, if the earth is really billions of years old, uh, then we don't understand the amount of helium that's in the atmosphere because there shouldn't, uh, there, there should be a lot more. We don't understand the amount of salt in the ocean. There should be a lot more. Um, and so when I look at the age of the earth from a scientific point of view, and this all started, like I said, when I was a grad student and I saw how radiometric dating was made, was done because I was happy with the earth being billions of years old until I saw that. And that made me start questioning. So I did a lot of uh, research and I still do on my blog. I have an age of the earth section where I talk about current research and so forth. Um, and so uh, 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 
what I do as a scientist is I look at all of the data and I say, okay, let's assume the earth is billions of years old. What do we understand and what do we not understand? Now let's, uh, let's believe the earth is thousands of years old. What do we understand? What do we not understand? What, we, what I find is we don't understand an enormous amount of stuff if the earth is billions of years old. If the mm. earth is thousands of years old, we don't understand a few things, but it's a lot more manageable. Yeah. And this, like you said, a lot of that has to do with the rates at which things are changing mm -hmm. that don't make sense if, like you said, the earth is billions of years old versus if it's thousands of years old, then the rates that we're seeing actually make sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. So. Uh, um, what's your blog, by the way, for our listeners, what, uh, where can they it's, check out? uh, you can go to blog dot Dr. Weil. So that's just D R W I L E dot com. So blog dot Dr. Weil dot com. And I have some categories and one of the categories is age of the earth, but I just blog about anything, any, any current scientific research that I think is interesting. So right now, right now I've been blogging a lot about COVID and things like that because I find that, you know, that's kind of. Current, yeah, you know. yeah, for sure. Everybody's yeah. interested in what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jay Weil is my guest this evening. If you're just tuning in, my website's educateforlife.org. And um, I've got a curriculum on my website. I've been teaching apologetics for about 12 years to my students. And if you are looking for curriculum, um, you can check out Dr. Jay uh, Weil's curriculum, bereanbuilders.com. And, and that's uh, science. That's he, just science. Science, just science. And um, he's been building a science curriculum for a long time in the homeschool community. You, you um, homeschooled your, is it your daughter? Um, also? Yeah, uh, we adopted her uh, later in life. So we were kind of non-traditional parents. We don't have any children we uh, had since infancy. Uh, but from the time we officially adopted her, we were her temporary guardians initially. Uh -huh. We have no, no freedom then. <laughs> but once we officially adopted her, then we homeschooled her through the rest of high school. And then she yeah. went on to college, got a degree that she doesn't use. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of people are looking for alternative form of, forms of education right now because of the fact that the the schools are shut down in so many states and um we're having a flood of kids coming into our uh our private christian school we're one of the only schools open here in southern california uh, but if you're if you're considering homeschooling and you're listening out there um this is a fantastic opportunity to look into some curriculum that um really is god honoring and yet very scientifically uh factual and actual. Well, if, if I could interject something on that whole issue, you know, right now uh, there's kind of a hidden blessing in all of this because a lot of people are forced to work from home and they're forced to have their kids at home and they're doing this, you know, uh, Zoom school and e-learning e and all of that. This is a great opportunity for you to actually experience what your children are being taught. I mean, it's hard for you to go to go to school with them and find out what they're being taught. Now school is in your home. Mm. Uh, and if you're just in the same room and doing your own work, you're going to overhear some yeah. of the nonsense they're being yeah. taught. And I honestly believe that, you know, uh, if I mean, when we when we were temporary guardians of our daughter and this was, you know, ages ago, you know, and I went to her school and heard the nonsense that was being taught. I was like, I can't believe the schools have gotten this bad since I was in school. Now they're even worse. Yeah. So I think a lot of parents, if a lot of parents just listen to what garbage is being poured into their kids' heads, they'll look for an alternative. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I've had this, this uh, happen several times with parents saying, whoa, I cannot believe what I was hearing yeah. uh, coming out of the teacher's mouth on that Zoom call. call the Zoom, you know, the, the teacher has uh, more accountability here with <laughs> parents being in the house and being in the room. So that's a good thing. Like you said, a, a hidden blessing there. Um, I wanted to, before, I want to talk about limestone, um, because I know you're an expert in this area. I know it's a bit technical, but, but I want to, I'm very curious because uh, it's not something that you get to talk about too often. Sure. Uh, but before we do, I, I like what you said when we were off air, you said, uh, when you see how the sausage is made, um, you don't want to eat it. So, um, I want to just take our listeners through what it would be like to walk into a carbon dating lab. And then you, you gave us already an illustration of what happens, but but um, let's say I, I came to you and I was like, hey, uh, Dr. Weil, I've got this, this uh, fossilized bone here. I want to date it or whatever it is. I want to carbon date this bone. Um, what would happen next? What, what happens as they walk into that lab? And exactly what is that process? That, well, actually, uh, it starts before then. Uh, it starts before then. If you think you've got a sample that you want to uh, a, a, a lab to date, you have to prepare it properly. 
you have to sample it properly. So I can't just dig up a, di a dinosaur bone, and hand it off to a lab and say, date it. Uh, because they want to know that it's been processed properly and all that. So the lab gives you basically instructions on what they're expecting the sample to look like, how it should be packaged. And all of that. And you don't typically walk into these facilities. You typically yeah. <laughs> you know, send them your samples and so forth. And of course, lots of money gets exchanged as hands <laughs> because this is how they make their living and so forth, yeah. which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so anyway, so you've got to prepare it properly initially. So, you know, if I want to send, I'm not going to send a big Tyrannosaurus Rex femur to them, right? <laughs> because first of all, these dinosaur bones are, are more precious than Ming vases. So you're not going to get rid of the whole thing, right? You're going to take a sample of it. And so you have to take a sample from the right area and do it in the right way and send that sample off. Once that sample gets there, now the lab takes over and does processing because there's still lots more processing to do. Because the problem is there's all sorts of carbon containing stuff in this bone. And some of that stuff was recently deposited in the bone. Uh, so <laughs> the first thing we have to do is we have to treat it in certain ways to try and get rid of any uh, uh, carbon sources that aren't from the animal itself. Um, and so there are, there are chemical processes and steps you go to go through that. And the hope is when you get done, you've got uh, carbon-based or minerals that have carbon in it that are from the bone itself, not introduced later, not the result of bacteria coming in and <laughs> contaminating everything, but this is stuff from the bone itself. And this has all been worked out, uh, and this has been, been worked out for 40, 50 years now, so we know what processes to do. So hopefully once we got those processes, then we have this sample that has only carbon-containing minerals that were in the bone originally. Those now, then go they, into a... Go so, ahead. so are they able to actually, because that sounds like speculation, um, how do you get to a point where you're confident that only yeah, the carbon-14... It's actually pretty thing? good. This is, is actually okay. pretty good because we know the way the bone makes minerals. And that's different from the way bacteria make minerals. It's different from the way the minerals that are naturally found in, in the crust of the earth are made and so forth. The body makes, uh, and the, not the, our body, the body of the animal makes the minerals in a different way, specifically to form bone matrix. So it's pretty easy to get rid of everything that's not real bone matrix. Okay. That's, okay. You know, and, and obviously, nothing in science is provable. Science can't prove anything. Uh, so sure. I can't prove that this, uh, these minerals uh, come from the, from the bone itself. But based on all the chemistry we know, yes, these should just be uh, minerals from the bone. And, and you know, to make sure this is, this is happening, the, this process has been tested with things that we know the age of. You know, if we've got a bone from something that was recorded when it died, you know, then we can, uh, carbon 14 data and see if it, it, you know, once we check the calibration, we see that it's right. And this has all been done. So, uh, you know, for things that we know the age of up to about 3,500 years, it works really well. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, I think that's okay. So the next thing is it goes into a particle accelerator where it basically gets vaporized. Um, uh, and once it gets vaporized, they add an electron to it that gets it charged. And then I can use an electric field to start whizzing that thing down a, a tube uh, and accelerating it with forming a beam of particles that go down the tube. Uh, generally then at some point, uh, the electrons are all stripped. So now it got pulled by the uh, positive charge. And now it's going to get kicked by that same positive charge because once the electrons are stripped, it's now repelled by that positive charge. So it's a really elegant technique to try and pull and then push the beam so that it's going really fast. And the reason you want it going really fast is when charged particles enter a magnetic field, they curve and they, and the one aspect of the curve, one thing that affects the curve is the speed. Hmm. And so if I know, if, if I know things like the, the mass of the particles and the speed and all of that, then I can figure out exactly what isotope or what, you know, what atoms are being, being sped down the tube. So we're, we're speeding them up so that they go through a magnetic field, they curve, and every different um, atom will curve in a slightly different way. And okay. so then we detect what curves all these guys follow, and that then tells me how much, say, carbon-12 is in the object and how much carbon-14 is in the object. Uh, and so uh, in the end, 
you don't have any sample anymore. And this is one reason you don't send the dinosaur fever because yeah. <laughs> you don't, you know, you, you don't have whatever samples left. And this is why, like, for example, when they tried to date the shroud of Turin, I was actually at the lab when they did this. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Uh, when they, uh, they had to get special permission from the Pope yeah. to just get a couple of pieces of fiber that had fallen off and had rested in the bottom of the display case because those are going to be destroyed, you know, and this is according to the Catholics, this is a holy relic, you know, yeah. so yeah. we don't want to destroy even a thread from this holy relic. Uh, so, you know, that, that, uh, and then of course, when, when they carbon dated to, to about 1300 AD or something like that, uh, then everybody said, oh, well, it's because you were dating the stuff that fell off and it's been contaminated and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but anyway, my point is it's gone. And so you, this is one reason you only send small samples because it's going to be gone. Okay. And then, and so after that process happens and they've detected how much C14 is there, that's when they're, they come up with the age and. Yeah. So they do a ratio of the isotope that's the, the radioactive isotope to some other isotope, like for carbon 14, it's usually carbon 12, uh, some other isotope so that, you know, you know, compared to how much of the other stable isotopes, how much radioisotope is there. And so that ratio then tells them how old the, uh, uh, how old the sample. Do these labs ever have situations in which, and I've heard of this happening, in which you have the same item or the same bone dating at millions of years differently? Um, or oh, rock? yeah. Yeah, and the older this sample is, the worse. And this happens a lot more with rocks than it does uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, bones because, once again, with bones, you're doing carbon dating, and there's not a lot of, not a lot of wiggle there. Uh, but, like, for example, uh, there are, you know, uh, uh, rock samples where if you chip it off one end and process it or anything, chip it off another end and process it, send both of those samples. It's not unusual for, the, for those dates to be 10, 15% different. And when you're saying, well, this is 2 billion years old, 10, 15% of 2 billion That's is a lot. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and what, and you know, and what people who are, 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 are believe in these methods will say is, well, you know, plus or minus 10, 15% isn't bad. You know, and that's really what it is. It's not, you know, we're not worried about the fact that it's 100 million years. What we're worried about is what percentage. But yeah. my, my, my uh, uh, response to that is always, if I had a chemical technique that was at best 10% accurate, it would never be used. Yeah. <laughs> because in the end, there are too many other factors. And all of these techniques that I use in all of my research and everything, these things have been, you know, calibrated down to, you know, 0. 0.1, 0.2% so that we know we're actually using reliable numbers here. And yeah. the, the kind of unreliable numbers that I see, that's like, like I said, the be making the sausage. When I started seeing these incredibly unreliable numbers coming from the premier <laughs> radioactive dating facility in, uh, uh, in the United States, or one of the premier, that's when I really started questioning everything. Yeah. And it's just gotten worse because the more... Uh, uh, we have had other people, the more we've had people like creationists dating things that shouldn't be dated. <laughs> we are seeing even more of this, you yeah. know? So yeah, the, like only creationists date carbon date dinosaur bones. Cause, uh, evolutionists say we know what the answer is, <laughs> Yeah, you know? Right. And so they shouldn't be dated <laughs> with carbon 14 and it's only creationists that have done this in the same way, you know, only creationists have used potassium argon dating to date lava flows that we watched. Because lava flows that we watch shouldn't be measurable by uh, potassium argon dating because the half-life of, uh, half half of the decay is way too long. It should only be used for things that are at least already millions of years old. Yeah. Um, uh, but creationists have done what shouldn't be done, and they found that, yeah, potassium argon dating says this 500-year-old lava flow really occurred 12 million years ago. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, that, yeah. I, it, it's crazy. So one of the, one of the things that I uh, heard that I thought was very interesting was that um, diamonds actually have measurable levels of C14 in them, and they should be they should be dated at millions of years uh, if they're found hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of years in the lower lower uh, of levels of the earth. Um, and then uh, somebody made the excuse that oh uh, well this is contamination from um, uh, radiation you know that has gotten down to the earth and, and contaminated the diamonds and and so forth. Uh, what, what? Yeah, I've actually shown them that's not possible. I've got. I've got a, a calculation on my, on my blog. One, an old earth geologist who sometimes comments on my blog didn't say that about diamonds. He said that about dinosaur bones. And I showed him the calculation. I said, there's just no way. Cause to, you've got to, you've got to turn carbon 12 into carbon 14. That's two neutron absorptions 
Uh, and that's really, really hard to do. And I showed him the percentage and I, you know, I said, there's no way I can make really significantly measure my amount of carbon 14 out of this, even over millions of years, because over millions of years, what little I made is going to decay away too. Mm. So we're really, and so, you know, that's not possible. It is not possible for natural radiation to do this. Now it's possible if I, uh, artificially make a really intense radio radiation source, or if I shove it down in the middle of the earth where there's yeah, a lot of yeah. radiation, yeah. then I can do it. But no, anything that's in the crust of the earth, any neutrons coming from the sun, there's no way that can explain this. This is okay. just not enough. Just out of curiosity, do you remember the moment where you, you kind of switched and you were like, you know what? I'm pretty sure I don't believe the earth's billions of years anymore. I now have decided uh, that, uh, you know, it's a recent creation. It's only thousands of years old. What, do, you, do you remember that? that was that a moment in time or was that a... I don't remember it as a moment in time. The yeah. moment in time I remember is questioning it all. When he mm. took that light pen and started Xing, yeah. I was like, <laughs> what? You know, so that was, that was the moment I started questioning. But then, you know, it was really a long time of research. And I'm, you know, in my opinion, I became a Christian specifically because I looked at both sides of the issue. I was an atheist, but I was open in mind enough. To look at both sides of the issue. And yeah. so I approach everything that way. So, you know, as soon as I started questioning this, I actually made an appointment with Dr. Harry Gove, the guy who developed this technique for yeah. carbon 14, because I wanted to talk to him about my concerns and so forth. And so I listened to him. I listened to a lot of my other colleagues who believe this stuff. You know, I read a lot of creationists. I talked to some back then it was harder to connect with creationists, yeah. but I yeah, actually sure. looked up the ICR phone number and I ended up talking to, um, Oh, what was his name? Uh, he used to write a bunch of monographs. He was a physicist. I can't remember his name now, but I talked to him for a long time. So I talked to a lot of people and read a lot of stuff. So it was really gradual after that. Gotcha. And I can't say exactly when that happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, for those of you listening, uh, Dr. Jay Weil, uh, you can check out his material on his blog as well as uh, brianbuilders.com if you're interested in curriculum. He's got a whole bunch of curriculum he's developed. And um, Dr. Wow, I wanted to talk to you about limestone, uh, rapid limestone formation and the significance of that, um, simply because there's not a lot of people that, that are experts in that area, but that's something that you've actually uh, spent a, quite a bit of time studying and, and researching. Uh, can you break that down for us as far as why is uh, rapid limestone formation a significant issue? Well, I wouldn't characterize myself as an expert on this. I know the chemistry pretty well. As far as the geology, I'm really kind of an amateur at this, but I've, I've obviously talked to a lot of geologists and read a lot of geological papers on this. So I'm yeah. more of an expert on the chemistry than, than the actual limestone itself. But here's the issue. You go to places like England and you see the White Cliffs of Dover. There are yeah. these huge cliffs full of chalk deposits. This chalk is almost all calcium carbonate, and calcium carbonate can form two in nature, at least form two different uh, uh, crystal structures. And it's all the crystal structure we would call calcite. Uh, so it's all calcite limestone. And the key is this limestone that we see deposited in places like the White Cliffs of Dover, it's made of very, very tiny crystals, uh, crystals that are on the order of a few millionths of a meter wide. Uh, and when I weather rock by, you know, rain or, 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 or water running or something like that. I don't make such small crystals. I make much bigger crystals. So we know that this limestone isn't the result of other rocks being eroded by the flood or something like that, uh, because the crystals are just too small. You can't explain them that way. Mm. So there are two ways you can explain them. Uh, uh, and from a young earth perspective, both of them are hard. Uh, one is there are these organisms called coccolithophores that uh, produce calcium carbonate in that crystal structure. They, these are microscopic organisms to begin with. They make little shells that are even that are part of the, the there's several shells, shells poor organism. So now we have a part of a microscopic organism. Then it get, cause it gets ground up. So oh, that's wow. small enough. <laughs> yeah, that's small enough. So that's one way. And that's, they think that's what the, white, the, the standard geological view is. The White Cliffs of Dover is a bunch of dead coccolithophores that have been ground up. Um, but you can calculate how long it would take to produce the White Cliffs of Dover from coccolithophores like that because we know enough about their life cycle and so forth. And it's way too long for any uh, young Earth view. The other way is precipitation out of solution. So if I dissolve calcium carbonate, it's slightly soluble in water. If I dissolve it in its tiny, tiny amount, and then I, then I cool the water down or something, so now it's less soluble, some of that's going to come out, and we call that precipitation. 
So when I've dissolved something and then it comes out as a solid, it comes out of solution as a solid, that's precipitation. And precipitation can make small crystals like that too under the right circumstances. But once again, calcium carbonate is so, in, so only slightly soluble that just thinking about filling the ocean with calcium carbonate, then making the precipitate, then filling it back up again, once again, way too long. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was thinking, I was actually watching, or I was actually doing an experiment where I was capturing carbon dioxide uh, from the reaction. And one way you capture cal uh, uh, carbon dioxide is you uh, bubble it through a solution of lime water. Uh, and what comes out is calcium carbonate. And you can actually wow. measure the calcium carbonate, and that tells you how much carbon dioxide you produce. And I thought, well, you know, if, when the fountains of the Great Deep opened up, there was probably a lot of carbon dioxide. And if there are any calcium-containing minerals in the mantle, and I really didn't know, but I thought, if there are any calcium-containing containing minerals in the mantle, they could make calcium carbonate. So I looked, and sure enough, there are a lot of calcium-containing minerals that, when exposed to carbon dioxide, could produce calcium carbonate. So I thought, well, you know, the first thing to do is, uh, okay, we know that this is the least possible. Let's see what kind of crystals we can make that way. So I just took this same setup that I had before, and I collected the calcium carbonate crystals I was making, and I sent them off to uh, an x-ray diffraction lab to make sure they were calcite and not the other thing, which is called aragonite. And sure enough, they were all calcite, so they're what we expect. And... The, uh, we, we went and did a lot of really beautiful uh, uh, scanning electron microscope images, and all of these crystals are really tiny. <laughs> I mean, they're on the order of a few millionths of a meter wide. <laughs> and so, so I see that at least we can make the specific mineral, and we can make it with the right crystals by just reacting carbon dioxide gas in water that has these calcium-containing minerals in it. Uh, and so uh, right now what I'm doing is trying to figure out exactly how fast this happens and how it changes with different temperatures. Uh, but I, I've been pretty impressed with how fast it goes. Uh, and I was really surprised that I could make these calcium carbonate crystals uh, with just bubbling of just a little bit of carbon dioxide through. Uh, I get a really nice conversion relationship or conversion ratio. So right now I'm, I'm just working through all of the uh, what we call kinetics, all of the uh, speeds and so forth, so I can publish a paper about uh, uh, how this all works. But I do know I can at least make the right crystal, and I can make it the right size. And so if, that's, if I can do it in the lab, then at least it's possible that this would be an explanation of where all these crystals come from. When the fountains of the Great Deep opened, it was all calcium or carbon dioxide uh, reacting with these minerals, forming calcium carbonate at the right size, and then it gets deposited. That's super interesting. So I guess my, my question that I was going to ask you there is, um, so the White Cliffs of Dover, right? That's a massive amount of, of limestone there. So what's your theory about how that, that I, I know you explained the process there that, that, you know, the fountains of the Great Deep come forth and, and uh, that pulls up the limestone. And it's able to make the crystals that small. Um, so are you, so what would that have happened when the fountains of the deep, Great Deep burst forth? What, what is yeah, I would think it happened fairly quickly because you would think the first thing to escape would be the gases. Okay. Right, so you've got this really hot mantle that's uh, that's you know uh, uh, liquidish. We call it plastic rock, but it's you know uh, in a pressurized liquid form, uh, and so it's really hot. So any gases that have been held in by the pressure of the mantle, once we open the fountains of the Great Drape, those gases are some of the first things to get released. So I would expect an enormous amount of carbon dioxide coming out right away, forming just a swath. You know, and if you look at the, uh, you know, at the bottom of the, of the Atlantic Ocean, you see this rift going from almost pole to pole. So you imagine yeah, an entire yeah. swath from pole to pole forming a bunch of this <laughs> calcium carbonate. And it's yeah, going to form it all in one big sort of mass. And that's going to carry, be carried by currents until it finally settles somewhere. Right. And so that, yeah, so that was my kind of question is um, the White Cliffs of Dover. I mean, we don't see that all around the world, no. um, but we would expect that we would, we would see that more. Do you think we would see that more um, based on that theory? Or is that just because of the way the waters move that it, we only happen to see it in that particular area? Yeah, well, you know, we, uh, molecules typically like each other, uh, especially if they're the same molecules. So generally speaking, once you form a bunch of calcium carbonate, if you formed it all close together, they're going to kind of be attracted to one another. 
And, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in fluid dynamics or anything, but I would expect if you're forming it highly concentrated in a, in a, in a, uh, in a certain area, it's going to stick together and flow together. Okay. So it's going to okay. flow all together mostly. And so, yeah, where it actually lands would depend on the details of the current and all of that. But I would think you would expect individual deposits. Now they'd be big because you've got the big fountains of the deep, but they'd be individual deposits. You wouldn't expect it broad scattering. Yeah. Yeah. And what is the evolutionary explanation for the cliffs of Dover? Do, or do they have a, a theory? Yeah. So, that? well, the argument there is that there are these coccolithophores that have died and gotten crushed. Just uh, over and millions and millions over of millions years. of years, you know, and, and that area of at the time when these white cliffs were de deposited, that area was very gentle. It was probably this lagoon with very little current. So these coccolithophores lived, reproduced, died, lived, reproduced, died over millions of years. And as mm -hmm. they as they died and got crushed and settled to the bottom, that was the that, that's the calcium carbonate that then formed the white cliffs. OK, OK. Um, and, you know, there, there have been a lot of creationist arguments for why that can't be the case. Uh, Ariel Roth, I think, is the guy who's written the most on that, but I do think John Woodmore Appy as well. And they have both given arguments as to why that explanation doesn't work based on other characteristics that you find in the White Cliffs. Uh, but no one's ever right. given a good explanation for how it could happen. So, Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, well, for those of you listening, uh, Dr. J. Weil, uh, Dr. Weil, we're just about out of time here. So uh, thank you so much for being on the program this evening. Oh, my uh, pleasure. Big blessing to have you. And uh, you guys can check him out, brianbuilders.com. You can also check him out on his blog. Um, say, say the blog again one it's more time. It's blog.drweil.com. So blog.drweil.com. And it's just D-R Weil, D-R-W-I-L-E. Awesome. And um, so. you guys know my website, educateforlife.org. You can check that out. If you're looking for curriculum for uh, at home, uh, my curriculum covers, you know, different religions dealing with things like Buddhism and Islam and how do we know that the Bible is the word of God, as well as a lot of the creation and science issues also. Um, and uh, so you can check that out. If you're looking for something, I know a lot of people are out there going, hey, the, the schools are teaching wild things or they're not teaching at all. So uh, this is a great opportunity uh, to check these things out. So uh, educateforlife.org is my website. And we'll be back again next week. We are going to be talking to um, uh, about uh, school choice week, which is another big issue that's come up now. Uh, we're going to be talking about the fact that um, numerous states now are offering school choice programs in which parents have more control over their kids' education. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, th thank the Lord for that. So uh, we're moving in the right direction. And uh, we'll just keep praying that God, um, God is gracious to our country and uh, we see a lot of uh, movement in the right direction. And uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Wow, for being on the program. My pleasure. It's nice to be here. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye.